fact. We just thought multiculturalism can work, but you need policy and you need genuine action. So the tone, the leadership sets is very important. We need people to arrive with their talents, with their hopes, with their dreams, with their capacities to work hard, to build. We don't want mass immigration coming into this country. No, migration is not a fundamental human right. We can, of course, do our bit to give a home to those who need one. I think we're showing the world that we can manage this with solidarity and fraternity. Our values, our identity, we will cease to exist. Several world leaders have registered their belief that multiculturalism is, in some fashion, divisive. David Cameron has, Angela Merkel has. Under the doctrine of state multiculturalism, we've encouraged different cultures to live separate lives apart from each other and apart from the mainstream. And natürlich war der Ansatz zu sagen, jetzt machen wir hier mal Multikulti und leben so nebeneinander her und freuen uns übereinander. Dieser Ansatz ist gescheitert. I think what we saw in the 90s was that countries were celebrating diversity as the the world became more globalized, more people were on the move and countries becoming more diverse. We just thought multiculturalism can work. What we are today paying in Europe is the failures of integration models that didn't work in the 60s, in the 70s, in the 80s. In the late 1990s, the early 2000s, it was all about the private sector and an assumption that the state could take a step back and that multiculturalism would naturally sort itself out. But you need policy and you need genuine action. What should have been a much stronger investment in creating the conditions for people to live together and respect each other. Neither integration nor multiculturalism in the traditional sense is actually an appropriate answer to integration. Multiculturalism is a good idea because it acknowledges difference. But what multiculturalism misses is the interaction. It is clear that all societies will be multi-ethnic, multicultural, multi-religious in the future. But I also recognize that for that to work properly, you need a huge investment in the social cohesion of your own societies. The leadership is very important to tell the population, just like Merkel, for instance, did in 2015, and she said, we can do this. We have so much done, we can do this. We can do this, and if we have something in the way, it must be overcome, it must be done, and the Bund will do everything in his power, to do it together with the countries, together with the communes, to do it together. That all of a sudden actually gave a certain message to German people. The welcome culture sort of erupted after Merkel said that the leadership, again, rather than encouraging these fears or bringing these fears in the front, that they could actually communicate in a very rational way. Canada is a country that was built by immigration. You can look around any room and see the diversity that has made us strong. Yes, we have received 1.4 million Venezuelan brothers and sisters. Does it create fiscal stress? Yes, it does. Does it create social stress? Yes, it does. But I think we're showing the world that we can manage this with solidarity and fraternity. This is something that we can deal with. And immediately also to make sure that the services and circumstances are such that local population is not adversely affected. You cannot only provide for refugees in a neighborhood, in a poor neighborhood where locals have similar problems, similar needs. I think it was a very common mistake designing of activities that are only targeting refugees. We need to ensure we're building a fairer, more compassionate New Zealand. We can, of course, do our bit to give a home to those who need one, whilst at the same time making sure we're improving the standard of living for all New Zealanders. In the last few years there are more social cohesion projects in which the donors finally realized that there should be also 50% of target population from the locals as well as refugees. There's also a, a very growing and strong citizens movement against this populist movement. One of the, the best examples in America would be when the Muslim immigrant ban, when the Muslim ban was enacted. This morning the White House is claiming the implementation of President Trump Trump's uh, travel ban is quote unquote a massive success story, but the swift reaction from around the country shows a very different reality. Overnight, another surge of protests against President Trump's controversial executive order. There was protests. There was massive protests at a lot of major airports. Hundreds of attorneys have volunteered their services as well, pledging to help those detained, including a rotating team of lawyers at New York's Kennedy Airport. And seeing that massive and almost instantaneous response, it was very reassuring to see that there was people from all walks of life that were willing to step up and say something in support of their fellow humans. One example, for instance, that I can give you is this is called the Ubergan 
Pellerand. This is a kitchen project in Berlin. The students from the university, they arrange that every Monday they're cooking together, like Germans and uh, people from different countries, mostly like refugees. They come there and they cook together with Syrian refugees. And through these local level grassroots citizens initiatives, that that kind of elements of what we say radical cosmopolitanism actually is happening. This housing complex is home to an innovative new project. Of the 560 people living here, half are Dutch students, while the other half are young refugees granted asylum in the Netherlands. It is open for a couple of months and in these months we see that it is working. I think one of the main ingredients is they have the same age, they have a different background, but maybe they have the similar future. These are local and micro, so one may say, well, these are actually small examples of how are we going to think about integration through these micro examples. But when we look at the totality of these things, as they get more and more, then their actually impact is much larger. So what starts small, it actually kind of compounds. And I believe small is beautiful, especially the local initiatives that took place. They started with small steps, but they did create a space of integration. And when I say integration, I'm talking about the two-way of integration, integration between the locals and the migrants. The hilltop town of Riace. It seems typical of a town dating back to medieval times, but there's something very atypical about Riace these days. While much of Europe is reacting warily to migrants and refugees from the Middle East, South Asia, and Africa, Riace welcomes them. And in Riace, there is actually a relatively harmonious and peaceful coexistence between refugees and local populations. That basically tells us is that if the certain conditions are met, if certain circumstances are in place, then people can become quite welcoming to others. Domenico Luciano is Riace's mayor. Having grown up in the crumbling town, today he's determined to reverse its sleepy image. Rather than shun migrants like the rest of the country, he wants to welcome them. In the Riace case, that the mayor mayor actually, before bringing the refugees, that he got the consent of the local people. He spoke to them, he told them that actually refugees are not a threat, that this would be a benefit to them, so that the tone, the leadership sets, is very important. Ensuring that those who are displaced by war and disaster have a safe place to live, it's the right thing to do. What does solidarity actually mean? It means to act. Solidarity is nothing one can think. It needs to be done, and it's done at ISIS level. Solidarity means recognizing that all these problems are my very own from the beginning, no matter if the effects of it are noticeable in my everyday life or not. Talk to newcomers, interact with them, develop relationships with them, because when you talk to them, you actually find out that they're not that different. Nobody knows each other. I mean, it's not like we are living together. We are living parallel lives. We have to get to know each other. When you put faces and stories behind the numbers, everything changes. So if you have a chance to speak to a migrant, we should always enjoy the opportunity to talk.